it's it's a good it's a good time to start and there we got the recording going as well. So welcome to uh, session number 11 of the Open Repositories Conference this year. It will be uh, consisting of three presentations fo focusing on DSpace and DSpace CRIS related uh, developments. But first I, I would like to say just welcome to all the participants and the speakers. Uh, I'm your moderator for this 55 minute session. My name is Jessica Lindholm. I work at Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. And I am here uh, as part of the Open Repositories uh, Steering Committee. And my, my role today is to help you uh, have a good session. Uh, I will uh, help out with questions, Q&A and keeping time. Uh, when the presentation has started, I will put a few links in the chat for, to our code of conduct and to the uh, notes document on Google that we have for this session. So, but with that, uh, I will go over to the, to the content part. So we have three presentations. They will be 15 minutes each. Uh, I will uh, be making sounds uh, if we are out of time, but hopefully I, I know we have good and experienced speakers here, so we will be fine on that. My ambition is that we will end, I think maybe since we started a bit late, maybe we will end close to the next uh, hour, uh, which will be lunch hour in my area, but uh, around zero, zero, we will end instead of 55. So, my, the first speaker is uh, Susanna Mornati, and she and quite a few colleagues, 13 of, 13 of them from For Science, has uh, submitted a paper uh, called DSpace Chris is here. So I will give the floor to you, Susanna. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, and uh, thank you all uh, participants and uh, open repositories for organizing this, uh, this conference. My name is Susanna Mornati from For Science. As uh, Jessica said, uh, we have a lot of uh, um, uh, colleagues uh, collaborating to this uh, uh, Space Chris 7 adventure that uh, has just landed a few days ago. And, um, uh, with the version 7, of course. For Science is a certified partner of the space. We have uh, plenty of certifications, ISO 9001. We are a solution provider of the Cloud Security Alliance. We have nine active contributors to the space, uh, three committers, and uh, um, 15 active contributors to this space, Chris, uh, especially with this version uh, 7. And we also, also contributors to many other related open source projects such as Dataverse, OJS, DuraCloud, and IIIF. We're also involved uh, in the definition of standards and innovative technologies together with uh, core next generation repositories, uh, SRIF, open air guidelines, signposting, resourcing, and the Notify project you have heard about yesterday at Open Repository. And if you want to know more about uh, For Science, you can check the sponsor's video that has been uh, made available here at Open Repositories. What is this space, Chris, uh, and particularly this space, Chris 7, is ready to use an out of the box free and open source extension of this space. So it fully embraces configurable entities that are enabled out of the box with a richer data model that is based uh, on the open air information space and uh, serif uh, to model the research uh, domain. It enables uh, real research information management processes and use cases beyond simple data storage and it is optimized and production ready. So um, what, the, what does the DSpace CRIS 7 do uh, beyond the DSpace 7 configurable entities? It additionally provides structured metadata, uh, particularly ternary relationships, for instance, between publication, author, and affiliation, and uh, the opportunity to uh, define nested metadata. It provides an asset security that is based on context. For instance, a principal investigator can see more details of their specific project, and it is granular at the metadata level. Uh, it um, features process management because uh, data changes follow different rules. And 
and uh, decentralized management, uh, uh, for instance, profiles can be self-managed, projects can change status and so on. And uh, it also features um, a short performance because uh, it is based on a proven battle-tested approach on hundreds of production installations for years to manage relationships. So, and the fact is that uh, research information management systems are huge and data are deeply interconnected. It is adopted worldwide from uh, East to West, uh, from uh, Asia to America. There's a lot of installations across Europe, particularly in uh, German universities and research centers uh, in, uh, in Italy, Spain, and Portugal, uh, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, uh, Serbia, and, uh, and so on. And uh, it um, features also a variety of use cases. It can go over a variety of use cases, such as the aggregator portals. Here we see the Portal de la Recerca de Catalunya, Eurocris, and, uh, and so on. It has landed. Uh, so finally, on the 2nd of June 2021, you see here our Frecce Tricolori. Uh, it was also the, the celebration of the Day of the Republic in Italy. So last week, we released the version 7 after so much work. And you can find more information here at the link. It is also posted on a, on a document uh, for, uh, for comments. Uh, here at Open Repositories, you have the Git, GitHub uh, links to download it. We have rebuilt it uh, from uh, the base code of this space, the main branch, and this makes it easier to check the differences and, keeps, and keep the two projects aligned. Particularly, uh, DSpace Chris 7 has uh, 2,500 more commits than uh, DSpace 7, uh, which is uh, representing 25% of the total commits of DSpace 7. And uh, uh, it also featured 20% more tests uh, before uh, uh, the release. There are uh, important early adopters of DSpace Chris 7, for instance, uh, the Peru Chris National Project for a national research information platform and uh, uh, the Synsecris project uh, that is uh, a, uh, studying the impact of uh, research uh, um, on agriculture and it is uh, uh, funded by the Ministry of Agriculture in Germany. For both of them, uh, you, find, you can find a, two, a poster at Open Repositories presented yesterday, it's still available. You can have more information there and you can join the conversation with us uh, for more ongoing projects on uh, this space, Chris 7. Uh, you will uh, have already seen this architecture. It is the same uh, identical architecture as uh, uh, DSpace 7. So it features a full, uh, a fully fledged REST uh, API and an Angular um, front end. Uh, and uh, uh, additionally, um, and this space Chris 7 has uh, a lot of interconnections uh, and using uh, interoperability um, technology to connect uh, uh, with uh, external databases to get uh, more data populated uh, automatically into uh, the um, uh, research information management database uh, and uh, also um, interoperability features to export all this data to for instance, the full uh, integration with the ORCID, PUSH, and poll that I will show uh, later. What are the key announcements of this space, Chris? Uh, the full ORCID uh, version 3 integration for pull and push information, integration with dozens of uh, external data sources, including commercial ones, to retrieve bibliographic, bibliometric data, and also data for other entities, uh, support for self-service researchers, profile management, and the approval workflows, it is aligned to the latest open air guidelines for literature repositories, for data archives, and for CRIS systems. And uh, it also features data quality tools to ensure that your information is always complete and accurate. Regarding the full ORCID uh, integration with version 3 ORCID API, uh, starting from the uh, login via ORCID that is supported, uh, you have uh, uh, more features here. Researchers can connect the local profile with uh, ORCID and be able to manage synchronization settings and, and preferences uh, to um, to pull and push uh, uh, publications, uh, information about funding, information about profile, such as uh, biographic data, employment, uh, uh, affiliation, qualifications, works, uh, funding. So you see here an example of how to import uh, uh, this data. 
And uh, uh, you can also display the authenticity or kits wherever appropriate on your profile or uh, in the authors uh, section of the uh, publication details. Uh, the integration is also with uh, data sources uh, that are uh, related to other entities. So import is supported for a wide range of entities and not just publications. For each one, uh, when you submit uh, a new item or a new entity, uh, appropriate options for import are shown. That's a large set of connectors, as I said, for bibliographic and uh, bibliometric databases, both commercial and open. You see Scopus, Web of Science, uh, PubMed, Crossref, uh, ORCID, as I said, uh, we'll find uh, also the European Patent Office Archive and, uh, and uh, many more. And uh, especially as uh, uh, Andrea Bolini already showed this morning uh, in a previous presentation that you can still check on the open repository, uh, we uh, implemented a, a, an interview integration with the open air research graph for, for several functions. So here you see an example of import from a uh, uh, patent, uh, personal details, uh, funding, you have a preview and you can decide to import this metadata in your uh, submission form that is compiled automatically. And uh, uh, it's also integrated with bibliometric databases, so you can uh, import uh, data both at the publication and the author level about uh, uh, the citation rate. Um, this space, uh, Chris Seven, features decentralized management, uh, which means that users, uh, also uh, end users, researchers, can have controlled permission to manage their objects, such as uh, 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 context-based profiles, publications, projects, and these edit permissions can be limited to specific metadata, and uh, related objects can be hidden or highlighted. Uh, users can request changes to the records if uh, they are not allowed to edit them directly and the change requests are uh, highlighted in a workflow for the repository manager with a claim button for the activity and a highlight uh, about uh, which metadata have been um, change or requested for change. And um, researchers can also edit uh, their own uh, profile and uh, CV and be able to export it in a PDF format, which is very convenient for a lot of uh, use cases. Another feature of this space seven is that it is aligned to the latest open air uh, guidelines uh, with different uh, guidelines, uh, the literature repositories, both version three and four with the uh, data archives uh, version four still unreleased, but uh, the, the draft guidelines are there and are implementable. And uh, also uh, the guidelines for uh, um, Chris uh, uh, managers, Chris systems. Uh, the public face uh, has a, a configurable layout based on a new angular architecture and uh, um, you can configure tabs, boxes, custom field rendering. You can uh, implement the interlink navigation because inverse relations are built automatically uh, linking to other entities. You can uh, uh, configure the sections to explore the database, browse, advanced search, faceting, listing, and uh, you have a, a, an advanced and extensible statistics visualization available using graphic charts, aggregated views uh, uh, for publication but also for uh, researchers and for their departments. You have a matrix visualization available for citations, for the H index, alt matrix dimensions, and you also have a network lab re graphically representing the links between your researcher and uh, the authors or co-investigators and other dimensions that you can configure. Uh, the public face uh, features also a uh, graphical representation of the search results uh, using uh, pie charts or bar charts uh, that you can also configure to uh, represent the latest years uh, or a uh, full uh, set of uh, research and other improvements uh, regarding virtual sections that are uh, implemented to explore the repository, for instance, homepage widgets for the most cited items or the recent submission, and also graphical and aggregated visualization of user statistics, for instance, a, a map to visualize the provenance of uh, your uh, hits and downloads. 
regarding data quality, uh, OpenAI is integrated with a notification broker also, uh, both for, for metadata announcement and also for publication suggestions. And uh, for that, uh, I also, I again invite you to, to visit the uh, previous presentation by my colleague Andrea Bollini uh, from the OpenAir ELD project, and also publication suggestions from ORCID are implemented. Uh, we uh, have automatic import uh, defined for um, Scopus and WAS and uh, other uh, bibliographic and bibliometric sources, a flow to request corrections on existing items that you've seen before that is uh, uh, different from versioning, which is an added feature, a duplicate detection, and advance uh, import and export capabilities uh, to and from uh, uh, Excel files or directly uh, the uh, database. Uh, let's see uh, quickly a few of them uh, regarding data quality. Potential duplicates are prompted uh, during the submission and uh, also the, the uh, review workflow. Uh, more details uh, um, are provided in a previous presentation. As I said, here you can see how uh, the uh, open air broker prompts uh, for enriching or adding uh, metadata to your publication. Uh, missing records in the repository are uh, automatically suggested, uh, not only from the open air graph, but also from the ORCID profile. Uh, so uh, whenever a new uh, record is uh, found in ORCID, is prompted for automatic import in the, in the um, uh, this space case. And if it is not enough, there's the ability to create new entities on the fly that can be referenced on approval of the source record, the ability to preserve identified of these related objects, even if uh, entities are not created, but it can be used for future attrib attribution. That's a publication export in citation formats using the citation style language. Um, this basically seven features an integration with a Grobid machine vision library to automatically extract metadata on PDF upload. Mapping of submission forms and workflows can be, uh, can be done for new collections using the graphical uh, user interface and also the edit of uh, the terms of usage. Uh, uh, time bind is supported during the submission. There is a complex validation mechanism across metadata and much more. So I just can invite you to explore uh, this case case seven. Uh, we have uh, a new versioning and support model uh, starting from uh, this version, uh, we adopted a different uh, um, uh, versioning model to assure faster releases, accurate tagging and checking of the changes across the different releases. All version numbers will use a schema starting with the year and major and minor. Uh, minor versions uh, uh, will be easier to upgrade. They will contain uh, uh, bug fixes, security fixes. The major version will be used to highlight important functional or breaking changes. All year versions will be major and uh, uh, the REST API is guaranteed to be backwards compatible. What uh, will be the next releases uh, in uh, after the summer? We'll, it will um, version two will be focused on uh, user experience enhancements and tools to simplify the migration from previous versions. And then by the end of the year, there will be uh, more um, uh, additional features. Check the roadmap for updates. Uh, the link is also on the document uh, that is related here. Last but not least, I would like to thank uh, the, the whole for science uh, team for. Uh, uh, participating in this big effort and also our partners and clients who contributed for the development of this Pescris 7, especially the Technical uh, University of Hamburg, uh, which I thank here. And I thank all of you and Open Repositories. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. There's uh, 10 seconds left on your 15 minute presentation. Super impressive timing. I'm very happy. Uh, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, so many impressive uh, developments in the space, uh, Chris Seven. We have a question uh, in the Google Doc that I will uh, read here. Uh, it says, to what extent can modules that exist in DSpace Chris Seven be imported into DSpace Seven, such as the CCAN integration? Uh, yes, uh, it is um, it is ported. So, uh, CCAN integration we 
uh, was released uh, a couple of years ago uh, as uh, open source and free from the community. We developed it for uh, uh, this space, but also this space Chris, of course, and uh, uh, whatever is available for uh, this, space, uh, this space will be also available for, uh, for uh, this space Chris. And uh, Andrea provided a, a, um, an answer. If you have more questions, you can put them on the document and we will answer also in the following yeah. time. Thank you. Uh, I think there is, uh, we do have time for a second question here that things can answer live and then also go to the Google yeah. box with it. And they ask migration uh, to the space seven. Are they yeah. going solutions to migrate from this space Chris to this space seven well um, of course you can always migrate from this space Chris to this space seven what uh, uh, I mean the database is uh, compatible uh, all additional data are in separate tables so uh, what happens when you uh, go from uh, this space Chris to this space is that uh, you will uh, miss some uh, data because uh, this space uh, uh, plain this space does not have a full functionality as this space Chris Perfect. Thank you, Susanna. Um, I think we will move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much. You. Uh, then we have uh, Andrea Bolini, Claudio Cortese and Giuseppe Di Giglio that has a presentation uh, on DSpace 7, Enhanced Submission and Workflow. And Giuseppe, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, hello everyone, I'm Giuseppe Di Giglio from uh, Floor Science and uh, with uh, this presentation I'm glad to provide you a deep dive uh, to the new um, submission and workflow features of uh, the upcoming uh, release of uh, this space 7. Uh, there are a number of uh, points I will uh, cover. Uh, with this presentation. So let's start uh, with uh, what's new in uh, this space seven. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a new model and user um, friendly uh, interface um, that provides the, 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 the user uh, many uh, features. Uh, the, the user interface uh, has been uh, redesigned completely and uh, this redesign uh, allows us to combine advantages uh, from uh, the two user interface uh, of uh, the, the previous release of uh, this space. Um, so just be Y and uh, XML, XML Y, but also to integrate uh, uh, new features uh, such as uh, the change circuit collection, automatic extraction of metadata, and uh, uh, to provide a, a unique workflow engine uh, like the config configurable workflow. Mm, uh, this, uh, this merge uh, allows us to to normalize some features. Uh, for example, we now uh, use uh, uh, only the live import framework uh, for, uh, the, for the extraction of our metadata. And um, um, we provide uh, so a, a customizable uh, system. And uh, finally, uh, with this new uh, release, uh, we increase uh, the performance that uh, we know uh, was uh, a weakness of uh, the previous version of uh, this space. Mm. So let's start uh, uh, describing uh, the, the new MyDSpace uh, page uh, that, uh, as I said, uh, um, was uh, uh, redesigned. And now we have uh, a new dashboard uh, where uh, the user 
uh, can have uh, all in, uh, in a unique uh, dashboard. Um, the user now um, have as uh, all the functionality immediately uh, accessible, so can uh, have uh, as an overview of. Uh, the incoming submission of uh, the status of the, the, the workflow and uh, uh, also uh, of the archived uh, uh, items. This uh, uh, dashboard is, uh, uh, divide, uh, is based on uh, the role of the user. So uh, by change, uh, by uh, means that uh, the role of the user, it can uh, uh, see uh, different uh, content. And uh, uh, from, uh, from there, for example, um, we have an overview of uh, uh, the the task present in uh, uh, in the workflow. Uh, now the, the user is able to, to filter search uh, the content by several uh, criteria uh, such as uh, collection, uh, submitter, uh, but also can uh, filter for a specific uh, metadata or uh, for uh, a text value. Also, uh, to, to all, all these, um, these options are uh, configurable and uh, can be different uh, by the configuration uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the, the MID space. Uh, a new feature interacted in uh, in uh, the MID space is uh, the opportunity to import uh, um, resource from uh, uh, external source. But uh, let's uh, consider this uh, in uh, more detail. Um, uh, as I said at uh, the beginning, um, we have now uh, a unique uh, uh, framework for uh, uh, the extraction of uh, the metadata, the live import that replaces uh, uh, the BTA framework used in the GSP uh, UI. Uh, this was done because uh, the BTA framework uh, uh, is not uh, maintained by uh, a couple of years, so uh, we decided to migrate to a native uh, framework available in uh, this space, and uh, that is uh, easier to, to maintain also uh, in the future. This framework uh, uh, provides standard component uh, for building any external provider that exposes data in XML format and uh, this um, and uh, the mapping uh, between the, the, the external um, uh, resource exposed uh, uh, can be done by mapping via uh, XPath. Here an example for, uh, of a response from uh, PubMed uh, pro, uh, provider. Uh, we have uh, an XML file and um, here is a, an example of a configuration uh, where uh, we mapped to the DC contributor author uh, two element of uh, this XML. And here uh, we have uh, how uh, it works in, uh, in, in the new my uh, this space, we can query uh, an external uh, provider implemented. Uh, now we have PubMed, ArchivX, Sherpa, Publisher, and Orchiperson. Mm, the user can search and select uh, one item in, um, and uh, then can import directly uh, and start uh, the submission. Uh, from uh, the imported uh, resource and complete the, the, the submission uh, later. 
But uh, moving on now to another important aspect uh, of the new uh, workflow module, uh, as uh, I said before, uh, now we have only the configurable workflow as uh, engine for uh, the workflow system. Uh, this uh, uh, allows us to have uh, a more maintainable uh, system and um, the, for example, the old uh, legacy uh, three step uh, workflow is now removed and uh, is only a configuration present uh, in, uh, in, in the system. Uh, for what concerning uh, uh, how it uh, appears for, for, for the user, uh, then we have a, a configuration where the user can, can see all the tasks in, uh, in, the, in the workflow and uh, every item uh, can have uh, a different action uh, depend on uh, the type of uh, workflow. Uh, because uh, the action are uh, dynamically uh, loaded. But uh, uh, let's consider uh, in more detail uh, a real use case. This is um, adapted in an early adapted project. Uh, uh, in this uh, repository, for example, uh, we have uh, several uh, institute uh, library and uh, uh, one central library that uh, um, uh, provide a final uh, validation of all uh, the item uh, that uh, has been to, uh, archived. And um, when, uh, when a, a user uh, create a, a new submission, uh, the, the workflow process uh, controls uh, by means, for example, uh, for, uh, by means of an external um, queries to an LED app, uh, if uh, uh, the user is affiliated with uh, an institute uh, library that has a library team for uh, the workflow uh, process. If, uh, if so, uh, the, the first step of the workflow is the validation uh, done by uh, the library team. Uh, each library team can only see uh, the, the, the workflow um, that belongs to uh, the, the specific institute. If the, the user belongs to um, an institute library uh, with uh, no uh, library team, uh, the workflow uh, go directly to the central library for uh, the validation. Uh, in the same way, uh, the, if the, the submission is uh, rejected uh, from uh, the library team, it return back directly to the submitter, but if it is rejected by the central library, um, if it comes from a previous uh, uh, library step, it return uh, from uh, uh, to to this um, to the library team. Otherwise, it return back to uh, the submit. Uh, now, the next area uh, I like to, to focus on is uh, the new uh, submission form. Uh, uh, as we said, uh, we have redesigned uh, the, the, the interface and um, we, we have now um, an easy to use and uh, intuitive uh, uh, interface uh, where uh, the user um, has all the information available in uh, only one page uh, form. Indeed, the, the, set, the section uh, that uh, um, belongs to the, 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 the submission are presented in only uh, one page, uh, can be uh, collapsi collapsible or um, 
can be removed or added if uh, uh, there are optional uh, sections. The, the page also contains uh, an integrated uh, file uploader, so uh, the, um, uh, the user can uh, at any stage upload uh, the, a new file to the submission. And um, now, uh, now we have- Two minutes have left. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have also now uh, the possibility to, to, to change the, the collection uh, uh, of the submission directly in, uh, during uh, the submission uh, process. Uh, there, there is also a new extended validation system uh, uh, that allows the, to, the user to understand if uh, there are some uh, errors or uh, pending required uh, field in uh, the submission because uh, it cannot uh, deposit the item if the submission form is not uh, completely um, filled. Another uh, important feature that uh, is optional by default but uh, can be uh, enabled is uh, the metadata enrichment uh, by identifier. Uh, it is similar um, to the extraction of uh, metadata with live import, but uh, it uses the uh, the identifier to look up the external uh, uh, sources and uh, uh, enrich uh, the, the submission with the, the data uh, extracted. Um, as we can upload the, the, the file in, uh, at any stage of the submission, we can also uh, edit directly the stream during the, the submission. Uh, we can um, add more metadata to the stream. Uh, we can uh, modify the, the, the access condition of the stream, and this is totally uh, configurable. We added some new input type to the submission, such as uh, uh, the autocomplete field, the lookup field, and uh, the tag field. Finally, uh, uh, I'd like to, to focus to the capability of uh, customization also for uh, the submission process. Um, this is an example uh, shown before uh, and available in uh, the space screens, but uh, uh, we can understand how it's uh, easy to uh, for the institute to fit the submission uh, on uh, their uh, needed by configuring the uh, available uh, section, but also by implementing uh, a new one section to, to the system. That's all. Mm, thank you for your attention. I'd like to invite you any questions. Thank you, Giuseppe. Currently, there, it seems you have made a perfectly clear presentation because there are no questions in the Q&A, nor in the notes document, nor in Twitter. Uh, so, but I, I suggest we move on to the next presentation. And Giuseppe, if, you. if you'd like to take a look in the Google notes doc, uh, if someone has questions there, maybe you can, you can have the discussion there. Uh, if there is not time at the end of, of this of this session okay so uh, we move on and now we go to the third presentation and it's a paper submitted by Levin Drogmans and Ben Bosman from Bosman perhaps from Atmire uh, on dspace 7 configurable entities Levin I think you look very ready so I'll just hand over to you Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Can everybody see the presentation OK? Looks perfect. Great. So I'm Levin Drokmans from Admire, the largest contributor to DSpace 7. And I'm going to give you an in-depth look at the configurable entities feature in DSpace 7. There is really a lot to cover, so I'm going to do my best to fit it in 15 minutes, so I'll dive right in. So first, quick background on how this came about. Um, a working group was formed to discuss the need for DSpace to be able to provide more support for different types of digital objects related to open access publications, such as authors or author profiles or data sets, many other objects. The objectives of the working group are listed here on this slide. And in this session, I will present the implementation that Admire did for the roadmap for entities, specifically for DSpace 7. So the working group held a series of meetings and recommended the following design principles for the implementation. First, we would avoid hard coding a particular object model. For example, the code shouldn't contain any specific Java classes or things like that for specific entities. Secondly, the data model should be configurable so that any institution can define which additional entities would be required for their repository. The design uh, of the solution will start from the DSpace item object and extend it. This was a very important point of the design as this facilitates a low barrier to use entities within all the existing functionality in DSpace, such as the submission, the workflow, the search, OAI, PMH, and all the other features of DSpace. So in order to provide support for entities, items can be typed and relations between the typed items can be defined in a configuration. So the first step of implementing an entities model is uh, a data model configuration. So if you have, for example, the objects person and publication, you can define an item type for each of those two objects and create a relation between the two objects that re represents, for example, an authoring relationship. A person can be an author of a publication and a publication can be authored by a person. Um, of course, other additional relationships can also be defined, such as an editor relationship. And defining the item types and the relationships can be done through a simple XML configuration. So let's take a look at one of the two use cases that have been implemented. So for these two use cases, there is a data model configuration present and all the features you will see are part of DSpace 7, but have to be enabled. So first, uh, the journal object and its subcomponents. So you have journal volumes, journal issues, and journal publications. And in this entity model, we wanted to demonstrate how you can build an hierarchical entity model in DSpace. So what does this look like in the user interface? Here you see an item page for a journal item. So and at the top of the page, you can see the journal metadata. So that's a metadata specific to the journal. In the middle of the page, you can see that there are two volumes in this journal. And at the bottom of the page, there's a search component that allows you to search through all of the related publications in this uh, entire journal. You also have a journal volume page. Again, you have metadata that describes the volume. You have metadata of the related items. So the, the related journal and the related journal issues that are part of this volume. And on the journal issue page, you again see the item metadata for the particular issue, the link back to the journal volume and a list of all the articles that are in this particular issue. Another concept in DSpace 7 with uh, configurable entities is virtual metadata. So I'll use the same use case to illustrate the concept of virtual metadata. You have a journal item with metadata, a title, a publisher, an editor, ISSN. There is also the journal volume item with its own metadata, the journal issue, which again uh, has some similar metadata as the previous two entities, which is also the case for the publication. So we see that in this example, the journal title and ISSN number occurs several times in each of those related items. And what the virtual metadata feature does is allow you to configure for the entity model, which fields are automatically retrieved from the related items. This has some interesting benefits. Uh, first of all, no duplicated storage of metadata and thus decreasing the amount of metadata curation you need to do. So when a journal title um, needs a correction, that correction only needs to be done in the journal item object and it will automatically propagate to all of the related items. 
Virtual metadata score is also available in OAI and all the other features. So we've already seen a few examples of item pages for entities and in the previous slides, but we will take a closer look at the display options um, for an entity and for the related entities on an item page. There are different templates available for the different entities and there are different display options for each of those entities. So on the next slides, I will use a second uh, use case that is implemented for DSpace 7, namely the research entities. So publication, person, project and org unit. And in this implementation of DSpace 7, all the entities can be interconnected. But for the example I will show in the next few slides, I will focus in on these three particular relationships. So a closer look at the item page for a publication item. So again, you can see that the publication metadata is in the gray area at the top. At the bottom of the page, you see the related entities, namely three projects and two organizational units. If you then look more closely at the authors list in the metadata section, you can see that two authors are displayed as links which means that these two authors are person entities within the system. You can click on the name, go to their profile. Um, and two important comments, of course, the author name is added as virtual metadata. So it's not on the publication, it's retrieved from the person item. And the authors that are entities can be ordered in the list of plain text metadata authors um, to ensure that the ordering is the same as on the published article. So if we go to one of those person item pages or author profile, um, in the previous slide, we saw how related entities can be displayed as a list. Remember the list of articles in the journal issue. We can also display them um, as a search component. So this is particularly useful when there are many related entities. In this example, a person with 190 publications and the search component shows you and allows you to search through all of the entities that are related only to this person. The sidewide search in DSpace 7, uh, as entities are items, um, they are included in the search results by default. But some of the additions have been implemented to enhance the user experience. So first of all, there is a label for each entity um, in the search results so you can easily identify the different types of items that you're looking at. And secondly, there is an item type search facet which allows you to filter on particular uh, entities. So DSpace 7 can also support multiple entity models. They can all coexist in, in one repository. So I showed you two models already, the journal and the research objects. Both of those have the publication of entity in it. So that's where the two um, entity models meet. So here we're looking at a publication item that is connected to a project, two persons, uh, two organizational units from the research entities model, as well as um, a journal issue from the journal entity model. And this publication is also connected to a data package from a third entity model where publications can be related to a data package. Um, again, as the concept of entities extends the item objects, metadata schemas and submission forms can be easily defined. So the metadata schema for an entity can be created in the metadata registry, just as for any other schema in DSpace. And the same applies to the submission process because if because entities are items, the regular configuration for submission forms in DSpace can be used to configure the submission forms for entities as well. Now let's quickly see how we can create relationships between entities in the submission forms. So there are two types of input fields to re uh, relate uh, an uh, entity to another entity. On one hand, you have a field that represents an open relation, which means that for the metadata field, the values can be either relations to other entities or plain text metadata. On the other hand, there's a closed relation field, which means that you can only uh, add relations to this metadata field and no plain text metadata. So what does this look like in the submission interface? The author metadata field is configured as an open relation field. You can type in a name as usual and the value will be stored in DC contributor author, or you can click a lookup button and search for an entity that you want to link to this article. So when we click on the lookup button, a search with a pre-configured filter on entities of type person will show up because the system knows that this is the, the entity that you're going to make a relationship with. There's a second tab in this window that holds the entities that the user has selected. 
So if we now search for a person with, for example, the name Gordon and hit the search button, we find the person that we're looking for, we select this person. And as you can see in the current selection tab, that person is now added to the selection to be added to the publication. There's also a second author with first name Allison that we want to add. We type in her name, search for her and add her to the selection as well. At the top, you can now see the authors that I just added. Now let's also add this article to a journal issue. So you can see that the text input uh, for the journal issue field is disabled because this is a closed relation. So we click on the lookup and we um, search for a journal issue. It opens the same pop-up window, but with a different search configuration that is now specific to journal issues. So it will only show journal issue entities. We select the issue that we want and we are ready to move on and it's added to the submission form. Um, one other problem that we tackled in this implementation is the challenge of name variants. As you all know, there are many reasons why, for example, authors don't always publish under the same name. Some people use a variant of their name to abbreviate their first name, or if somebody uh, gets married and assumes a new last name. These name variants can also apply to all of the other entities, for example, an organizational unit that can change names over time. So we decided on a flexible approach where, first of all, a person can store a list of possible name variants in its profile, but doesn't have to. The relationship between the person and the uh, entity and the publication will store the value of the name variant as an attribute of the relationship. So you can create a relationship with the name variant without the need of having that name variant be displayed on the author's page. This is particularly useful when an author has a name that is misspelled on a publication. So that way you can still use this name as mentioned on the official publication, but link it to the right, correct person and not having to show that misspelled name on the person's profile. So going back to the submission form, um, the name variants are included in a dropdown, as you can see here. Um, there are name variants that are stored on the person entity and the user can select any of these name variants to be used on the particular relation for a publication. Besides the suggested name variants from the person profile, user can type in a new name variant to be used for this relationship. In this case, Dunning A um, as a, a new name variant. And when this new name variant is entered, the system can automatically verify whether the current user has a permission to edit the person entity. If so, the submitter can, with a single click, easily add the name variant to the person's profile. Um, importing entities, the implementation also allows you to integrate a lookup for entities with external sources to import person entities. Um, here we're importing a person from ORCID, but you can configure and or implement as many external sources as you like, such as a connection with your institution's uh, internal HR system. The search query here will be sent to all of the available external resources uh, uh, simultaneously. And a button next to the search results from an external source allows you to import this data into the repository into a new entity. For this person, there were no matching uh, person items found already in the repository. And so the user can decide to import this person as a new entity from ORCID and then indicate the destination collection for that particular entity. Two minutes left, Levan. Yep. You can also edit relationships when an item is already published in the repository. So on the edit item page, there's a new relationships tab that allows you to edit the items relationship. Um, this is the, the edit page for a journal issue. We can remove existing relationships between a publication and a journal issue. And for when you try to do that, note that there could be virtual metadata configured and the system will ask you, okay, this is the virtual metadata we have for this connection. Do you want to copy that over in regular metadata so you don't lose any information when you delete a connection? You can also create new relationships in the same way as in the submission forms. Um, next, batch import for entities is supported. So the CSV import uh, um, supports related items. You can import a new item, create a relationship between two new ones, um, etc. So you can do anything you need to do with the batch import to import entities. And finally, beyond DSpace 7, the entities functionality opens DSpace up to support many new use cases and will, can be used for a much broader array of content. 
So um, even when you continue to use your DSpace for open access publications, entities will allow you to place the open access publications in a much richer context, for example, by integrating it with a, a CRIS system that you might have in your institution. And it is likely that new needs will arise in particular contexts or use cases and that functionality for specific use cases will be developed over the next versions of DSpace. An example is the use of data sets. Um, if you want to relate publications to data sets in your repository and store some of the data sets that might require functionality to upload very large files in smaller pieces, being able to pause and resume um, file uploads. So we're very interested in seeing how these entity models uh, will be used in different implementations of DSpace and continue the development for future versions of DSpace. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Liv. And it seems uh, the, the two questions we had uh, have been answered uh, during the, uh, the presentation, but I, I'd like to give you the opportunity to maybe provide some aspects on one of the questions is a lot about the migration between DSpace Chris, DSpace 7 seems interesting. So uh, there was a question if uh, migrating to DSpace 7, are there going to be easy solutions to migrate from DSpace Chris uh, to DSpace 7? So that's yeah. one of the ways people would like to talk about uh, migrations. Yeah, in terms of entities, there's a, a, I assume, a difference in the implementation uh, for entities. Um, for science has implemented some concepts slightly differently than in DSpace 7, as far as I know, and I'm not involved, uh, or nobody in the community is involved with the DSpace Chris 7 implementation. Um, but migration uh, from the two systems uh, in, in both directions, I assume would not be very complicated to do as they are built on the same underlying um, architecture and that DSpace Chris uh, builds extra features on top of DSpace 7 with probably a slightly different approach for some features. So there might be some, some details to be worked out if you want to migrate from one solution um, to the other, but it should be relatively straightforward. Thank you. Uh, we are running out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank the presenters and all the participants, of course. Uh, and then I will see if I can steal the screen from you, even here. Oh, sorry. Make an attempt. Thank you. Uh, and just, just like to uh, remind people of uh, the networking session in two hours. Uh, I guess our, uh, our sponsors will be there and perhaps even uh, Susanna, Giuseppe and Levan will be there live uh, meeting people. Uh, and the rest of the uh, conference is the third keynote. And then uh, two, one more uh, parallel session of presentations and then the closing and ideas challenge. And one of the things going on this afternoon is of course the uh, information of how open repositories will look, will look in 2022. So that is kind of uh, interesting, I assume. So I see the chat is blinking, but I can't really see it. So people are saying, thank you very much. The sessions were very useful. That is good, I agree. So thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to see you in the networking se session in two hours. Thank you. Thank, thanks for moderating, Jessica, and hello to the Serbian team watching us on YouTube and contributing to shared Google Doc. Great idea oh. to collect questions there. See you later. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Irina.